Okay, so I've had people ask me, how do I do this? How does this vase mode thing work? Especially rocketry people. Guys who are regulars to my channel, you pretty deep understanding probably already of how I do this. I want to give a basic primer, Tinkercad, of how I make complex phase mode shapes. So there are three dimensional objects that have multiple complex surfaces. This is the wing with a top and a bottom and an airfoil. It's all single wall phase mode. Enforcements throughout. You can see those lines. Lines are reinforcements that keep from being efficient. And you have you know, rockets. All these complex, you know, launch lug built in somewhere. There. Launch lug is built in. Eye hooks are built in. Fins are built in. Reinforcement ribs, everything. Even big giant nose cones like this are all multi surface vase mode components. So here is a basic primer of the technical aspect of how this works. I'm not showing you how to design parts. I'm showing you how the basic concept works. And then you apply these concepts in designing your own parts. So first things first, the entire part has to be vase mode compatible. So what does vase mode mean? So that's the first thing. Let's describe what it <laughs> That's annoying me. I can see it. Um, so what does vase mode mean? Vase mode is one single continuous extrusion. So there really aren't any layers. Not really. Um, say a barber hole has layers? No, it has a spiral. Helix. So um, a layer is print one discrete layer, print another discrete, print another discrete, print another discrete. The problem is those layers all have imperfections. They have many, many points where the printer has to stop, retract, make a travel move somewhere else, push filament back out, and then begin extruding again. And that never, almost never happens perfectly. Every single time that printer has to stop, retract, move, begin pushing, and then begin extruding again, we have imperfections. Imperfections create weaknesses. Well, so think of it like this. We have a piece of rope. I'm going to use a cord. So let's say we have a cord. That cord is strong. What if I were to take a bunch of little cords this big and just glue them end to end? Well, every single point where those cords glue together is a weakness. And you much more easily be able to take that cord and go and break that cord versus this single solid cord, which is going to take a lot more force to break. Well, this 3D print, do I even have a regular 3D print? I don't even have a regular 3D print. Yeah, I do. This is a bad example because this is actually in vase mode, but imagine a regular 3D print. Every place where you start and stop is a point where that print can break. Um, even above and beyond the adhesion of the one filament layer on top of the other. Because you have two weaknesses in plastic. You have voids where you start and stop, which creates an imperfection. Then you have the actual bonding of the two layers of plastic together. So that layer bonding is a weakness, and the voids created by starts and stops is a weakness. It's also a point of failure. The print can fail at that point. Also, it's not very efficient. So you end up with a relatively heavy part, you know, relative to a phase mode print part, going to be mostly hollow. And weigh like nothing. This weighs like two and a half grams. Whole threaded connection here. Side and outside wall, ribs, launch lug, everything on here. This weighs next to so light you almost think like what? <laughs> it just feels so light. This is heavy because it's using a 1.4 millimeter nozzle. So big fat extrusion coming out of there. So that's real heavy. But that's also in phase mode. Now phase mode also has the advantage of even if your printer is not quite perfect it's okay as long as it can as long as it can you know, reliably and consistently extrude all you have to do is make sure that first layer sticks down if that first layer sticks down and assuming you follow the rules of vase mode a moment your print is going to succeed very unlikely to fail because failures 99.9 .9 percent of the time assuming it's not a mechanical failure, I'm talking about a design failure here where something goes wrong during the printing process going to happen during a retraction, extrusion, or a travel movement. So, you know, if you have a little bit too much filament here and the print head moves from here to here and it crashes into this because there's a little too much filament there, your part gets knocked off the bed or gets knocked out of position. We've seen it happen all the time. Then you end up with the spaghetti monster on the printer. <laughs> you end up with a big, I don't even have one, you end up with a big pile of, you know, filament just 
spaghetti monster. So, um, phase mode is that's almost impossible. Very, very unlikely. You can still have something bump into it. You can still over extrude and have a collision, but it's far less likely because you're not moving from here to here. You're just going around, around, lifting up as you go around. So the probability of a conflict, a strike, or an impact is almost eliminated. And if you get the flow rate right, the force is on the model. I have had a tube, a three-inch tube, so only three inches, not five inches, break free from the bed. Like the cat went up and sniffed it, and I heard the model break, came off the bed, and just the mass of the model just sitting there, it weighed almost nothing. It's this, it's this large in diameter, three inches. Just a model sitting there, it just continued to print on top of it. <laughs> as soon as it finished, I just went. <laughs> I was like, how did that work for 40 minutes? That's the magic of vase mode. If you were doing a regular print jumping around, no way in hell. That model would have been off the bed and <laughs> it would have been wasted six hours of printing. <laughs> vase mode is pretty amazing. And vase mode also forces you to be an engineer. You now have to think about model design. You have to think about structural engineering and how you're going to build a model using as little material as possible. This is like eight grams. <laughs> it weighs so little. So you, you are now forced to think about not how strong can you make the part, how strong does the part need to be to perform the function? Kind of like an F1 race car designer. You're now not designing, you know, now there are guys out there who are making high power rockets using 3D printing and they're printing things solid. It's just a solid chunk of plastic. But, you know, they're, they don't want to have to worry about, am I pushing this too far? They want to stuff a big motor in there and launch the thing as high as they can. And that's fine. I want to fly on cheaper motors. So I engineer my models to be as strong as they need to be and no more. So this, for example, is a five inch nose cone. And it weighs like 200 grams, two pieces. So you actually have a slip fit shoulder. So this converts from the slip fit into the body tube threading that is built into the nose cone. And this is reinforced, this is a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. So this is actually a pretty heavy print. But for its size, it is probably lighter than a vac form nose go by or it's on par in that 10 or 15 percent range of mass i'd have to actually compare it but that's a five inch diameter 390 millimeter tall plus shoulder plus screw threading nose cone weighs about the same as a vacuum form nose cone but i can make this on my printer at home for about a dollar <laughs> and if you um put a box around your printer you could print this in abs or asa maybe a buck 25 and now you're you know you're good to 100 c 90 c you're never gonna see and you can do much more complicated things like this empennage or slider i'm working so this would fit into here like this and your wings would fit into here like this you can make some pretty sweet looking little gliders now this is a big heavy one but my light, my 0.4 millimeter nozzle wings, so we're talking um, 200 millimeter wing, about 180 millimeters, 190 millimeter wing, 190 millimeter wing, 15 grams. That's a fully air foil. Strong as it needs. Keep it as light as possible. So I'm going to show you the basic concept of how base mode works. Now, you have to follow rules. Base in, in 3D printing have what's called islands. For example, if I want to print this shape. I can't do it. This cannot be printed base mode. This can be printed base mode. This can be printed base mode. This cannot be printed base mode because you have two islands that are separated here. The printer has to move from this to this, back to this, back to this. You can't do that. You cannot have islands. Um, what else? All of your surfaces have to be interconnected. So normally, a cylinder like this is not a valid vase mode print. Solid cylinder, where you only print the external wall, that's a vase mode. 
But if I want this five millimeter thick wall, I can't bait. Because you have this surface and you have this surface. You have two distinct separate surfaces. Can't have that. You cannot have two separate surfaces. Must be able to move one to the other with one continuous extrusion. Can you technically print this phase mode? Yes. The printer will go, okay, well, I'm not supposed to do that, but okay, I'll print this, then I'll stop, and I'll jump here, and I'll print this. You stop. Compromising the structure. It will not be as strong. You also need to worry about um, overhang angle. So this is a 3D printing roll. The reason I print this like this and not like this, well, actually, I could print it. But like, for example, one of my, one of my rocket fins, you need to watch out for this underhang angle, as you can see. Back angle on that fin is pretty sloppy. Because it wasn't quite enough angle. Unless you have really good cooling, you want more angle. So if you have a fin that has a shallow up and a front, well, just turn it upside down. Now you have a nice steep up. Now, this is very shallow, but because it's sitting on top of previous printed layers, that's okay. It's only when it's unsupported layers that you want to make sure you have a nice angle. That's why all these angles are pretty. Make sure you don't have droop. Plastic is molten coming out of the nozzle. You need to support it. As long as you follow all those rules. So, for example, when I print this piece here, you can see I didn't have support for that surface there. So that failed. When I redid that one, failed one. Where's the good one? I have a good one here somewhere. I don't know what I did with it, but I have what I did was I have some triangles on the inside of the model that start off at zero and slowly work themselves out at like a 60 degree angle. So by the time they get up here, they are supporting this structure when it tries to print that. That one right there. Yeah, there we go. See? All those little triangles in there printed so that when it got to these parts here, there was something there to hold it up. Think about this kind of stuff when you print this. This has the same double wall structure, side and outside wall, and then actually, you can actually see that gives the model much more rigid, much stronger versus the model without it. Without the inside wall, you end up floppy. You're strong this way, you're strong this way, but you're not very strong this way, and you're not strong this way. Double wall gives you dimensional stability. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking about that. So how do you make this vase mode compatible? Because this is vase mode compatible. Now, if you just make a cylinder vase mode, you're going to have a very floppy cylinder. So I also have all these structural ribs inside. Very little mass, lots of strength. And you cannot bend a paper tube this hard. A nog tube, sure, but a regular paper tube, you'd kill it if you tried to do this. Like, bam, squeeze. You saw my Narcon video, you saw me destroy one. But the one of the beast fun. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you the basic mechanics. And same thing, here's a motor mount. That's a, that's a 38 millimeter motor mount. Yep, 38. With attachment points for your shot cord. Do a paper tube in here, and then this threads into the bottom of your rocket. It's all vase mode. So now this is a modular rocket system. I can now thread whatever size motor mount I want into this rocket. This one actually has top layers, or actually bottom layers, so that exhaust gases don't go out the back of the rocket at one end. Feel the knob. So here's the basics of how this works. We are going to go into Tinkercad, and I'm going to show you. This will work for pretty much any modeling program. You'll have to know how to use your modeling program and how to bend it to your will and make it do what you want. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off with a, a tube, not just a cylinder, because we want to actually make a rocket. Let's say we're going to make this rocket like this. Yep. Sides. So let's see. Um... Uh, my normal tube is 75 millimeters, which is 35, 37.5, 7.5. That gives us a 75 millimeter tube, or roughly three inches. And I want my wall, let's say I make my wall three millimeters thick. 
So now I have a tube, but this tube has two surfaces. You have this surface here, which is vase mode compatible, and you have this surface here, which is vase mode compatible. But what did I say you can't do? You can't do this. You can't print two separate things unless think them. Now I'm going to exaggerate this to make the point. I'm going to put a big fat hole right in the side of this model. So in Tinkercad, this is called a hole. So when you overlap a hole with a model, whatever is um whatever is um congruent between the two of them, which is wherever they wherever they overlap, the hole will delete from the other model. So I then merge these two models together and we now have a vase mode compatible cylinder because now we no longer have this surface and this surface because this surface is now connected by this surface here and this surface here. So if we lower this down to something that looks more like a, a drawing, you'll see what I'm talking about. So now when the slicer looks at this, let's say you start here and you draw the outside and then you come inside, draw the inside, go back outside, draw the outside, come back inside, draw the inside, come back outside, draw the outside. You now have a vase mode compatible cylinder. Now, of course, we don't want a big gaping hole in our cylinder. We want a solid cylinder. So how do you get that? Well, that comes down to pull path. G code is pull pathing. It comes from the CNC era, and we use it in 3D printing. We simply added Z. So toolpath is XY movement of your kinematics, and we simply added Z. So now we can do X, Y, and Z, and you have 3D G code. What we're going to do is we're going to make this really thin. So if I change this to be 0.01, Now, just for editability in the future, I'm going to center these two parts, okay, so that this will always be on the central 90 degree plane of this. Now I merge them again. Now we still have our cylinder. It's a whole cylinder, but there is technically a hole here. If we zoom way in, you can see there is actually a gap there. And you have this surface on the right and you have this surface on the left, which means this is now vase mode compatible. You can draw the outside, move inside through this gap, draw the inside, move outside through this gap, draw the outside. That's how you make a multi-surface object vase mode. Now, this alone is going to be pretty weak. You're talking about two flimsy single wall cylinders connected by this single line. That goes through the model. You can actually see that single line on the model here. There. That line right there, that extra thick line where it seems to double up. Well, that's my line. Is that it? Yeah, right there. So that there is the line. This cut right here that moves inside and outside the model and allows you to print a vase mode model. So what about the ribs? Well, that starts to require knowledge about how 3D printers work. So let's take this apart again. Now this one's actually pretty easy. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna align these with their edge. So that now this cut plane will still cut all the way through this model, but it's sitting directly on the edge. Now, this is important. Tool pathing works in an interesting way. So let's say you draw a tool path on your printer. So you lay down a line of filament like this. Now, this is a line of filament being laid down. Think of this as your cylinder. On, in Simplify 3D, the tool path is determined by the outside perimeter of the model. So let's say this is the outside, this is the inside. But this here is the inside, okay? And I'm going to draw this. Well, the way it's going to draw that is by running along this outside edge here, 
and then the width of the filament inward. So it'll be along this edge here, and then this will be the 0.4 millimeter wide extrusion. Some slices are different. Kira tool pass down the center of the filament. And so you measure 0.2 millimeters left and right of the tool path. So simplify 3D, outside edge, 0.4 millimeters in. That's your 0.4 millimeter extrusion. Kira runs the center and 0.2 millimeters to each side of the center, giving you your 0.4 millimeter path. Not drawing two paths, just where in the slight in the in the slice engine it's drawing its marking line. It's important because we need a rib to reinforce this model. That rib has to create a rib inside this model. Remember, this space in here is hollow. You're printing this outside wall and you're printing this inside wall, but you're not printing anything inside here. So it's a four, it's a four, what, three millimeter thick wall that's filled with nothing. It's hollow. And we need it to not be completely hollow. We need some reinforcements. We need something something in there to give the model some strength, some stiffness. And here, you can see that one. All those ribs right there that give this model some actual strength. Now, the way we do that is we have to have the tool path from the inside come outside. Now, you can go from the outside inside. This model actually does both. This portion of the model is outside in. This portion of the model is inside out. I do that because it's easier. It's a lot easier to do this when you have a symmetrical radial shape. The inside of this shape is symmetrically radial. The outside is not because it's got screw threads. So the slot here is going to be completely different than the slot here than the slot here. But if I do it from the outside in, then this determines if it's different, not this. And so they're all the same. So for the threads, I do outside in. And for the body tube, I do inside out because inside out looks prettier. You don't end up with all these um, lines. You can see these lines, but you can't feel them. So if you were to look at a solid part like this, you don't see any lines. You see the, the polygons of the shape itself, but the nose cone itself looks nice and smooth, and you don't see 16 of those going around the cone. But down here, you do. Okay, you see all those ridge lines where it goes in, out, in, out, in, out. So that's the difference there. Now, you need to come out and then turn around and go back in. So you're literally forming a U. You're, you're, you're literally, if I were to draw this out, it would look something like this. Come here it would look a lot like this and then this would be your outside wall this would be your inside wall something weird yeah i did this is a pretty good approximation of what you're drawing so this would be the inside wall of your cylinder that would be this wall in here and this one here would be the outside wall of your cylinder this surface here and what we're doing is we're creating this little rib that makes a U-turn, that comes down and makes a U-turn and then goes back. And we do that with this little cut plane going through the model. 
But as you can see, we can't actually go all the way through the model. Otherwise, we'd create a break. And if you create a break, you violate vase mode because now you'll have two separate islands. You can't have. So the how far this cut goes in, think of this as being just close enough to where the imperfections of 3D printing cause these two surfaces to just touch. So they melt together. Technically, there's a gap between them. And that, well, that gap is basically zero because this path is drawn from this line in and this path is drawn from this line here in. This path is 0 0.4 millimeters. This path is 0 0.4 millimeters. So I need to make sure this space you see here, that is this cut tool right here. That's this cut plane right here. I need to make sure that cut plane is this width from the outside. And again, that width is the width of this filament path and the width of this filament path. Since I'm printing with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, that is 0 0.8 millimeters. Now, Cura draws from the center. So it's half of this and half of this, or one times the nozzle diameter, or 0.4 millimeter. And then this space can't be zero dimension. This space would have to be one times the nozzle diameter. Now, it's possible thin wall behavior will compensate for this. You'll have to try it. It looks like it works in Prusa. I got to actually test the G code to make sure it prints. Because if, if this spacing in here is not right, then these ribs won't actually attach to the outside. You'll know you got it wrong because this will be extra floppy and you'll start hearing crunching when you just bend it gently as the ribs separate from the outside wall. They didn't actually move together. You need to make sure that they actually connect. So you'll have to make a cylinder like this and make a test print and try it and get the settings right. That also means you can't scale complex phase mode models. Because if you change the dimensions of the model, you change the dimensions of the gapping. Now, if you're going to go up in model size, up in nozzle size, you can. So, for example, this is modeled for a 0 0.6 millimeter nozzle. So, I could scale this down to, um, what is it? 75%. I could scale this down to 75%, and the gapping will shrink to exactly what I need for a 0 0.4 millimeter nozzle. Or I can double the size of this. And now my gapping will be exactly what I need for a 1.2 millimeter nozzle. That's getting way more complex. Basically, you can scale it you know, 5 to 10% up or down. And usually, your thin wall behavior will compensate. If you're to go smaller than larger, smaller, you might end up with a little bit of marking on the outside. But the model will still work. Larger, you might break the model. If you're not over extruding enough, then the... The rib won't touch the outside and you won't have a structural integrity. You won't have a structured modeling surfaces next to each other. And they won't be strong. Um, so basically, you got to redo all this when you change the scale of the model. But the result is you get to make nice complex shapes like this that all fit together in vase mode, it weighs nothing. <laughs> Ways what an SD's model would look incredible how light can make these. So, this means we got to create certain rules. So, the rule is this gap can be basically zero, just don't go below 0.1, or Tinkercad starts to throw a fit. Actually, Tinkercad's fine, certain slicers start to throw a fit because they start to think that it's actually zero dimension, they start creating error. And then this gap here has to be. 0.8. Well, that's easy to do here. Now, with a cylinder, this is a lot easier than with a something like a cone. We're going to get to that in a minute. So, we take this piece here, we've centered it on the model. So, we, we're centered this way and we're centered on this edge, which means these two edges are lined up. I need this edge to be 0 0.8 millimeters away from the edge of the cylinder. So, what I do is I grab this. I hold down the shift key and I move it in that direction. When I hold down the shift key, I'm restricting it to X and Y. If you don't hold down the shift key, you can move both X and Y. So if I don't hold the shift key, I can move this all around. 
But if I hold the shift key, it'll only let me move it either purely this axis or purely this axis, but not both. So I just move it an arbitrary amount this way. See this number? That number there is how far I moved. Notice it's a negative number, so we're gonna have to remember that. I click on this and I type in negative 0 0.8. There, I now have a rib that is negative 0 0.8 millimeters away from the outside wall. Let me move this away from these other parts that we're playing with. Now, I need to rotate this rib. A little trick, I'm gonna make a dedicated video, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put down a master ring. And a master ring is, you're just gonna create a ring that's bigger than the entire model because Tinkercad rotates on a two-dimensional plane. So you see this two-dimensional plane it's outlining? That's how it determines rotation. It does not rotate radially. It rotates on a plane. So the only way you can rotate radially is if your X and Y are the exact same size. So you create a ring, hold down the shift key, select the cylinder. This here is your alignment tool, upper right-hand corner here, align. Now the thing is, right now if I align them, both are gonna move. And I don't want them to move. I want the cylinder to be the anchor. So I hold down the shift key again and I click the cylinder. Now it's going to move the ring to align it with the cylinder. So only the ring moved, gray means they're in alignment. I can now use this ring to rotate anything else. So I wanna radially rotate this slot around this tube to create ribs. So I'm gonna select this, and I'm gonna hit Control D. I just told it to duplicate that rib. I'm now gonna hold the Shift key and select the ring, and I'm gonna rotate this. You have to do this in one motion. This is a trick in Tinkercad. I'm gonna do 22 and a half degrees. There you go. If you're inside, it moves at 22 and a half degree marks. You're outside, you can move at one degree marks outside that compass ring there. Let it go. Now you see it created a second cut. Don't touch anything. Now just hit Control D again and it will repeat the motion. So Control D. There's another one, 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 another one. And now I'm going to create another one back at the root. So I created one more than I needed. So I have two ribs here. That's important because remember, one of these ribs has to fully penetrate the model. So I take one of these, hold down the shift key, drag it out. There. Now all of these ribs cut into the model, but stop 0.8 millimeters from the edge, two times my nozzle diameter. This rib goes all the way through the model. Highlight them all, join them together. And now what you have here is a cylinder where one of them cuts all the way through and the rest of them only cut part way through. That's important when we go into the slicer. So we're gonna export our Epic Theron. Let's bring up our slicer. We'll see what this does. So here we have our cylinder. And in the slicer, I'm gonna tell it to do no top layers, no bottom layers, one single outline, and we're gonna use single outline corkscrew or vase mode or spiralize mode. And then I tell it to print. Now, did it work? We'll turn on retractions, tool head, and travel movements. If you see any blobs or any red lines, then it didn't work. If you don't, it did work. And this tool head should basically stay in the same spot all the way up and down. That tells you that it worked. See more closely what it's doing. And see that, where is it? This one here fully penetrates. So you have this tool path going in and this tool path coming out. That means I've connected the inside and the outside surface. Phase mode compatible. While this rib over here does not fully penetrate. It comes out, touches the outer wall, turns, turns again and goes back, makes a U-turn. This is one unbroken line. And then this is an unbroken line.
So it'll start off here, it'll draw the outside, it'll come inside, it'll come over here using the inside wall, it'll go out, make a U-turn and come back, and then it'll come over here, come out, make a U-turn and come back, it'll come over here, come out, make a U-turn and come back. So this is now a two-walled, reinforced, structurally engineered component that is all phase mode compatible. And you can come in here and look, and you can zoom in and make sure these are actually touching, see? No gap there. So this is actually touching this. Unless you're under extruding, enough of the plastic between here and here will touch each other to fuse together. That will give you your engineered structure. That will give you your reinforcement without adding a whole lot of weight. Now, if I did this wrong, so for example, if I did this without the cut, let's say I didn't select this one. And now you see, I saved it without the cut. Now we export that. Now you're going to see all kinds of alarms go off. Yep, there it is. Are all the blobs inside? Are they actually inside? Why isn't it showing me retract? There it is. So here you have your zits. They're all, they, they just look weird because they're all in a line. You are all over the place. So you can see this red line is a travel movement. And this here is a retraction. So that means it stopped extruding filament here, moved to here, and then began extruding filament again. And there should be a second one on the inside. I don't know, it's probably in the same spot. Yeah, there it is. It's putting it inside wall here. There it is. You got lucky. It's putting that one inside one of the ribs. So you got lucky with that one. So there is your retraction from the inside. And there's your retraction on the outside, and here's your travel movement between the two surfaces. The rest of the perimeter is phase mode, but I forgot to cut all the way through the model, and you'll see you'll see the two retraction points, you'll see the travel moves surfaces. So this this will work, it will print, but this entire section of the model will be compromised to structural integrity. You got lucky on this one in that the it's right at a rib has the highest probability of being reinforced. But um, on a more complex model, that would be a problem. And this is also going to make it take longer to print, higher the probability of failure, et cetera, et cetera. But the nice thing is, when you slice a model like this, I am now making a tube that is probably 80% as strong as a solid infill tube, but it's only 29 grams. So this tube will weigh 29 grams. Well, if I had printed this tube with a single perimeter and let's say, you know, 75% infill. Now it weighs 88 grams. So almost three times as much. I mean, granted, it'll be a strong tube, but it's waste. And look at the print difference. 12 hours and 50 minutes versus two hours and 45 minutes, 10 hours faster. <laughs> that's a big difference. And for a much lighter model, but that's how that phase mode works. Um, now you can also get more advanced. I'm gonna go over this really quickly because it can get pretty involved. But for example, what if I want to split this, highlight everything, but I want to unhighlight that ring, unhighlight that ring, and unhighlight everything. So, what if I want to do a um, a spiral cut? I want to I want to print this with a spiral. Well, all we're going to really have to do is tilt the cut. So we take this and we tilt it. Now, one trick is can't go past this point here on the outside. So there, there's a limit to how far you can go. 
the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make this much taller because the spiral cut is going to be um, longer than the straight cut. And we tilt this so we get close to the outside edge there. Stretch this in. See there, you can tilt it until we are almost touching that edge. You can get closer if you want more than enough. Now this gets a little tricky. So this cylinder should be 75 millimeters. Yes. So I need to create a solid cylinder that is 75 by 75. And it needs to be the same height, 117. Same number of sides. <coughs> Now we're going to actually this needs to be how do I do this again? Actually, no, that doesn't have to be. Yeah, we need the solid cylinder. We're gonna make it a different color though. Now I align this with the center cylinder using shift, attach the center cylinder to make it the anchor. So I'm aligning this with that, not moving them both relative to each other. I then need to create a box big enough to cover up this entire ring. It needs to be 117 tall. Okay. This, I need to bring this to zero and also make it 117 tall. Okay, and now that might need to be centered. Okay, we are too much angle. See how we're outside? Can't be outside. So we gotta bring the angle in a little bit. Uh, let's bring it in. Bring it back to zero. Bring it back to 117. There, we're inside. Just gotta make sure you're inside this wall. You can't be outside this wall. And then we turn this into a solid. Turn that into a solid. We turn this into a hollow. And if you, um, if you have any familiarity with this kind of stuff, you realize what I'm doing right now. I am cutting my slice to be conformal with the outside surface of the model because it has to be equidistant. So now I select both of these two models and join them. And now my little red model, I can now get rid of this cylinder. I don't need it anymore. And oh, that did not work. Why didn't that work? Oh, I joined it with the wrong model. Oh, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. So first, <laughs> we make this a solid. We make this a hollow and we cut the block to be conformal to the cylinder. Now you see the block is conformal to the cylinder. Now we cut the conformal block to our slice. And now we only cut away the material that's on the outside of the cylinder. Now, as you can see, that looks just like my spiral slice. Now we have to turn that into a hole and we still have to move it 0 0.8. Hold shift, move it that way negative 0 0.8 if you go the other way it's positive 0 0.8 there we now have our slice 0 0.8 millimeters away from the outside wall and it's a um spiral slice now same deal verify that our cylinder and our master ring are in link with each other they are gray and gray which means we can use the master ring to rotate so we take this, control D, hold on the shift, link it with the master ring, rotate it 22 degrees, let go. Now just keep hitting control D. And one more, because we need to grab that one more and bring it out. That's not what I wanted. You grab the wrong one. Oh, got a fetish for grabbing that one. It wants that one. I want this one. There we go. Grab that one and slide it out so it penetrates the wall. 
Remember, one of them has to penetrate. And you need to use the one that is on the X or Y axis so that it moves straight out. That's why I grabbed that one. I could use that one. I could use this one here. I could use this one here. Or I could use this one here. It has to be one that is on the X or Y axis so it overlaps with the one that's underneath it. If you grabbed any other, it's not going to move in line. Now, you can do that. You could put the work plane on one of these other ones. If you get the model to select it. There it goes. And now I can move that one sideways. But it's easier just to pick one that's on the normal work plane. It's a whole lot easier. So now I have my ribs. They're spiralized. They're all 0.8 millimeters away. And I have one penetrating rib. I then select them all and join them. Now there is an issue here. This is probably too much of a spiral. I would probably use less spiral because you can't put a fin here. All right, you can't have two cuts overlap each other because then you have two islands you can't have an overlap. So this, the spiral needs to be shallow enough to allow you to put your three, four, or five fins on there, and that slice has to fit between two fins. So you can't have a fin cross over the slice. So you have to shallow up that angle. If you're gonna put, if you need, if like a three fin model, this might work. Yeah, this will probably work with a three fin model. If I have the fin start here and end here, this will fit within 120 degrees. But a four fin model, probably not gonna work. I would have to shallow up that slice a little bit. But now, watch what happens when we export this and slice it. This is where it gets cool. This is where you start to still go, wow, that is neat. <laughs> Look at that. Actually, this model's broken. I did something wrong here. Yeah, I got all these retraction points. That means something went wrong. Where is the other start point? Oh, there's a glitch. See, it's trying to draw something right there for some reason. That's actually a glitch in the model. Um, that's a Tinkercad thing. Um, it could also be my slice angle was too. So the different facets of the model are inter each other. That's possible. I never did a slice this before, but you get the idea. For most of the model, this works perfectly. You have your nice, clean spiral. But that's how we got that. Let's see here. Show you in here in transparent mode. See all the slices, spirals. Isn't that cool? Cones are a little more difficult. Um, but in reality, you could do the same thing. The trick with a cone is create a multi-part cone make a cone a part cylinder so for example this cone here this double wall cone but this is not so what i did was i cut off the top of the cone and vase mode print clean top it's actually a hole in the top to allow this entire cone to print vase mode um, so this is a straight up um cone literally it's a cone while this is hemisphere stretched out when the angle starts to get extreme or when i think this is going to look good i cut the top of the cone this i do my cuts and my ribs the exact same way i did the cylinder that same process works exactly the same thing keep a solid copy of the cone because you're going to hollow out the center of the cone too keep a solid copy put a box over it Cut the box to the shape of the cone, and then you cut the rib to the shape of the box, which is normal to the cone. Lay your master ring and you rotate. Then you make sure one of them cuts through the cone. So on this one here, here's your cut through, cutting through the cone. And then up here, I do the exact same thing, but because the um, this is a cone and it's also not flat inside, there's also a cone on the inside. You can't print flat in phase mode. So the inside is also a cone. So I use this I use this cone itself to hollow out this cone, make it um hollow inside, then it stops right about here. Ribs. An outside surface. 
that allows you to have that cut without ever having to switch out of base. I think that's why the shoulders are all angles. Can't do a 90 degree opposite shoulder. That won't work. So what I do is I just make sure inside surface has a chamfer. And then this has a chamfer. What I do is I make this chamfer shallow and this chamfer so they overlap as much as possible. This is an incomplete cone. You have a nice big gap here. That a See the, the actual line, pretty minor there. It's a pretty minor gap there. Two are able to overlap. See on the inside of this one, there's a chamfer on the side of that. There it comes down to 1.2 millimeters times this. That chamfer by that chamfer. Now, to do the chamfer is actually pretty easy. All you do is drop a cone in here, turn it hollow, um, make it some arbitrary height. You want it relatively tall, so 60 plus. Then just make the base diameter bigger than the cylinder. Just make sure it's bigger. Highlight both of them. Use your center tool. Shift, select your cylinder so that you're moving the cone and not moving the cylinder because this keeps everything aligned with your master ring. Very important. If you lose alignment with your master ring, you've got to disassemble to get back to a symmetrical part to align with your master ring. I'll explain that in a different video. Bring it up, flip it over, then you drop it in until you get your cuts like that. I'm gonna turn off my snap grid and I'm gonna move this down. We know this here stops 0 0.8 millimeters from the outside. So you want your cone to completely cover up those cuts. Now you know that this remaining material times your nozzle diameter with the inside outside ring that's the smallest you can go without breaking base mode so now this i'm actually going to make taller because i want a steeper angle i'm going to drag this down make that a steeper angle i'm going to have to come up here and move down into just covers up. I can't. Not letting me grab it. Because it was behind the box. Bring it down until it just covers up those slots. Now I can join these two parts together. And now I have a nice little camper inside that tube. Now, because this tube is straight, right? Because this tube does not have any angles, I can scale this on the Z axis only. I cannot scale it on the X and Y axis. You first have to disconnect the little cone here. Right? So um, you now take this and make it taller. That won't break your vase mode. Now I could probably fit four fins on there. There's 300 millimeters tall. Verify my gapping is still good. I like it. I'm okay with that. Now I can remerge that. Go. Now you have a taller cone. Now this cannot scale. What you would have to do is, um, what you could do is delete all your ribs, move your rib back out. 0 0.8 millimeter so it's normal the outside edge of the cone scale the cone then move the rib back in 0 0.8 millimeter and rearray the rib you can do that not scale a finished cone because otherwise the the gapping that you created between the rib and the outside wall that will scale as you scale the cone 
because the inside cone is going to scale at a different rate than the outside cone because it's a different size. So the spacing is going to change. Can't do that. I, I can show you what I'm talking about. If you take um, if you take a shape like this, if I scale this shape, it stays the same as I go up and down. No matter how much I go up and down, X and Y don't change. The outline of the object doesn't change. It stretches, but it doesn't change. But if I take an object like this and stretch it, right now we have a hemisphere. And now we don't. We have an oval. And it's going to keep changing shape. And if I put two of these next to each other, and I make this one smaller, and now imagine they are merged together. This is my inside surface, this is my outside surface. I'm going to leave them apart so you can see this visually. If I scale them now, you can see they scale differently. The, the height difference changes. So, for example, right now, this one is, let's make this one 40, so I can show you what I'm talking about, and make this one 45. So the difference between these is five millimeters. So if I take this and this and I scale it, well, now this one is 53 and this one is 47. That's almost six millimeters difference. I'm saying, well, okay, well, I can just rescale this one. That won't work because this, what do you call this? The shape that forms between this point and these points alters, it's skewed. So your 0 0.8 millimeter gap will not stay consistent. At the bottom, it's gonna be pretty close to 0 0.8. The farther you get the top, more that gap is gonna deviate from 0 0.8 and you won't have an integrated structure. So you need to redo your cuts. It's gonna change the shape of the cone. Um, straight object like this, you can get away with. A non-straight object like this, you cannot get away with it. And even this one here, you cannot change the X and Y. Because if you change the X and Y, the relationship between the two segments of the model will also scale. So what started off as a 0 0.8 millimeter gap might become a 0 0.9 millimeter gap. And now your inside wall doesn't touch your outside wall. And now you have two loose surfaces. You end up with more of this. And you don't have an integrated structure anymore. If you shrink it, the gap between the rib and the wall becomes too small, and the slicer interprets that as a cut, and it breaks through the outside wall, and you lose phase mode, and your model becomes ugly. So it, there's complications, but that's the idea. That's the basic concept that you can create these really interesting advanced phase mode objects that are structurally very strong, more than strong enough. Like this three inch tube will handle level one high power rocket. Eat your I motors, maybe even a baby J, not a problem. Built your body tube out of um, half millimeter plywood. <laughs> I'd say you have a pretty strong body tube, right? You know, half millimeter plywood is not very strong, but if you have a half millimeter tube inside of a half millimeter thick tube, joining them together with ribs all made of plywood, would you feel that pretty strong? It would. It's impossible, but it would be strong. Well, that's it. PLA is actually slightly stronger than plywood. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. The plywood has a tensile strength of twenty-seven point six to thirty-four point five megapascals. While PLA has a tensile strength of 37 megapascals. So PLA is stronger than your typical plywood. Now, of course, that's same for same. Obviously, this model is a 0.4 millimeter thick wall and a 0.4 millimeter thick wall joined together with ribs. So you would have to compare that to a plywood tube 
that was a 0.4 millimeter thick layer of plywood and a 0.4 millimeter plywood strand of ribs. But same for same, PLA is as strong as plywood. And plywood is already 10 times stronger than we need for rocketry. Not 50 times stronger than we need for rocketry. I mean, they make high power rockets out of paper and balsa. Okay? So the, the materials are there. The material strength is there. It's a matter of design. Your primary problem is and not heat flight. Now, okay, try to fly a vase mode print rocket at Mach 3. It might soften in flight and collapse. <laughs> okay? Because you only need about 40C for this model to collapse, 40 centigrade. And at Mach 3, some of this model is probably going to hit 40C. <laughs> but for your average high power flight, people don't typically fly that fast. We don't, because it costs a lot of money. Those people know what they're doing and they're not going to do that. And if I printed this at a solid PLA, it would handle Mach 3 just fine. Your primary issue is two things. Heat on the ground when you're not flying. So, for example, um, this part would probably be okay in the sun. This part might not be okay in the sun. A solid part, not a problem. But remember, this is a single wall print. Phase mode. It's got multiple walls, but each of those walls is a single wall. This dark color could absorb enough solar radiation to heat up and then warp. Okay? This would probably be okay because it's a light color. Um, you're also going to have a problem in your car. Now, I'm not talking about flight. I'm talking about um, sitting on the pad or, or laying out on the grass for an hour. It's going to get hot. I want that to happen. In your car, you got to leave your windows cracked or it's going to get hot enough in your car for these parts to start going, eee! <laughs> okay. Or you got to print with ASA or ABS. But as far as flight stresses, it's a plywood rocket. It's not going to fail for flight stresses unless you design a poorly designed rocket, in which case it would have failed if you designed it that way in plywood too. <laughs> okay? So that, that's on you. That's not the materials failing. That's the designer, the engineer failing. Um, the only other issue might be the ejection charge. Not entirely sure about that yet. I plan to put some wadding inside the stuffer tube. One of the reasons why my motor tube, do a paper motor tube, paper is actually a very good like this plastic from heat. Now, if I put a, a 25 second burn high power motor in here, okay, things might soften up, maybe, but I bet you that paper tube would still be enough. But um, you could probably go direct plastic want i don't want to I'd rather have that little tiny safety margin of the paper tube it also means i can have the paper tube run up inside the model i can run my paper motor tube all the way up to here and i can put a centering ring here but now not only am i not exposing all of this model to heat but that exhaust that ejection charge has a chance to cool down if it's running up the stuffer tube and I only have to pressurize this much of the model to put the laundry out. Put a piece of Nomex over the stuffer tube. That'll protect your parachute, and that'll catch any embers that come out, and I'm betting you. On the five-inch model, I don't think anything's going to hurt that, unless you Roman candle it. If you Roman candle it, you're going to melt the model, but if you Roman candle your regular high-power model, you're burning it to the ground, too. <laughs> yeah, your model's made of paper. <laughs> Unless you're flying a carbon fiber model, you're going to toast your paper model too. So that's not really a failure. Um, but a slight, um, I don't, AP motors afterburn. I know some black powder motors can afterburn. A little flame out of the um, ejection side, casing for a couple of seconds. That's usually enough to cook a paper model, but that's, you know, nasty in paper. I don't know if that's enough to cook one of these. But then again, paper motor tube, not a problem. Simply unscrew your motor tube, tear out your paper, glue in a new paper tube, put in your motor mount again. And you're back in flight. <laughs> because none of that ever actually touches your model. You're good to go. That's it. If you have any questions, ask down below. If you want to see a tutorial on something more specific, I can that are doing that i could try to put something together for you i know this is a bit long but it is a bit involved um it's a pretty um pretty advanced process especially for tinkercad 
Uh, you can also do this in things like Fuse, SolidWorks. I don't use that. I don't use those. That's one of the reasons why my models have so many facets because uh, maximum resolution is 64 polygons. Um, around this. So oddly enough, the smaller I make my models, the more round they are because it's the same 64 polygons. So on a model like this, you can't even see polygons. Body. Can't even see polygons because it's the same 64 polygons as this model. Basically. Um, but it's free and it's super easy. Make some ridiculously complicated things. Get some complex models. This whole entire I I, I recreated the SDX pin system at request. Previously I would make all my parts except for the paper tube. 3D printed, postcone, launch lugs, centering rings, threaded motor retention, pins, fin can, all of it. Fins are E2X compatible. I can put these fins on an E2X rocket. And I can put E2X rocket fins on this thing. I designed this to be printable mostly in vase mode. Important. There you go. I bent one to see how far it would take to bend and break it. I got it almost 90 degrees. <laughs> that was a glitter filament so compromised on glitter are pretty darn flexible right motor mount right here there's a pin hold your motor in place works pretty good now I can design the entire model Oops. Tie downs for your shock cords are built in. Your quarter inch launch lugs are built in. All you have to do is paper tube in here, tie on your shock cord, and you're done. The only glue this model needs is together. Technically, you don't have to glue it together, but you probably should. We'll put some enough tape on there to give that a nice friction fit. Um, I only did small enough that anybody can print. Or I wasn't doing other people, so I would just. That's one piece. That or print it. Oh, I made this. This is if you want to get these all screwed together. Again, all that's practical and possible. Add a half a millimeter of tolerance to find something. So the, the 29 millimeter. If I make my hole half a millimeter of tolerance side. That's you. Yeah, you're good. Fun. That's the whole thing, Prince. Like this one. Rock. I even recreated the Sunrock Hydra. <laughs> it's fun. Working on a boost glider. Glider wing. Have any questions down below? I I'll go over. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go over the spiralizing with more detail. I'll go. Over. All these parts for upper bottom layer. Water tight parts, not really water tight. We call it water. By having that times enough. Top and bottom layer. Sometimes the top and bottom layers can be and also opportunity failure. Printing that if it bottom layer rips up outer perimeter by eliminating the top and bottom large failure. My launch lugs. Okay, launch lug grows out. This top side can be flat if you want, but it's better side like that, so Bottom side has to have an angle out and print. Technically, that's base mode client, and technically, gravity will. <laughs> so, don't argue with gravity, just lose. <laughs> but, um, it. any questions? Ask down below. Justin, I will be showing off.
Okay. I mean, I can't do something. Well, I'm gonna. Do it. <laughs> now I'm really gonna do it. 